Good morning, everyone. I'm Michael Duff, and I'm a senior advisor in the Bureau of Counterterrorism at the U.S. Counter um, uh, Bureau of Counterterrorism at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, this is the panel: hate and polarization in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, I want, before we go to our panel of experts, I just want to note that uh, my gratitude to uh, Laura Ellsworth. Um, I spoke at the inaugural Eradicate Hate Global Summit uh, a couple years ago, and I said, Laura, this is a global summit, and I want to have a panel on uh, what I think is a blind spot for a lot of policymakers and practitioners, and it's uh, groups from the United States and around the world flocking to uh, Central and Eastern Europe uh, to network and train. And so she said, go for it. And last year we had uh, a great panel and it had, uh, um, I, I think one, uh, one table over there was the number of people in the audience. So it's uh, flattering to speak in, in front of a larger audience uh, this morning. Uh, but let's get into, uh, um, w without further ado, let's, uh, uh, let me introduce the, the panelists. Um, to my left is Dr. Hans Jakob Schindler. Um, he's the dir senior director at the Counter Extremism Project. It's a think tank based out of Berlin and uh, New York. Um, joining us virtually, we have Dr. Uh, Julia Ebner. Um, she is a senior resident research fellow at the London based Institute for Strategic Dialogue. Her latest book is Going Mainstream, How Extremists Are Taking Over. Um, over here we have Dr. Michael uh, Vesechka. He's uh, an associate professor at the Bratislava International School of Liberal Arts in Slovakia. And then uh, we have Dr. Thomas Renard. He's the director of the International Center for Counterterrorism in The Hague. And we also have Dr. Adela Levis. She is the academic liaison at the Global Engagement Center at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, she recently completed her dissertation in, um, on uh, authoritarian populist elites in Eastern Germany. Um, I'm going to give each panelist five minutes, uh, starting with Hans, uh, to present, and then we're going to go into a moderated discussion. Super. Well, thank you so much, Michael. It's really a great honor for me and, of course, my organization CEP to be here and to also open the panel a little bit, given an overview of what we're going to discuss in the next three, uh, 60 minutes. Uh, I would like to just make three points. So first, um, to approach the issue of hate and polarization in Central and Eastern Europe, in our view, it's really important to recognize that violent far-right and far-right extremist networks in that region have really undergone a transformation in the past 20 years. CP and our partner organization, Klopsek, are in the process of finalizing a larger scale research project that maps out some of the important networks in four countries in that region in more detail. While after the fall of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s, Eastern Europe far-right extremist networks were looking westwards for inspiration on how to organize themselves and for ideological narratives. For the past decade and a half, influenced by new extremist far-right narratives that our colleague Julia Ebner will explain in a bit more detail this morning, um, they have organized and grown stronger. So that for some violent and far-right uh, extremists in the West, the image of what my colleague Kasper Reykjavik, who was here I think last year, has termed the far-right Shangri-La emerged. While that mental image is certainly wrong, it is also clear that the combination of these new extremist far-right narratives in, in, uh, in part exploited by more populist strand of politics in some of the countries in the region, which our colleague Mich uh, Mikhail Vasheshka will analyze in this panel, reinforce, in reinforced by deliberate efforts by the Russian stakeholders to exploit social fissures that our colleague Thomas Renard will address today, has created a more breathing space for such networks in the region and that they have maybe in other regions. However, it's important to highlight that there is a, sometimes a utilitarian approach to all of this by some of the governments. So if they're useful, some of those networks are simply left off the hook. And as soon as political experience requires it or it demands it, they're back reined in. Therefore, in some cases, some hopeful Western right-wing extremists have found themselves either denied entry or being extradited rather than welcomed with open arms. And some of the Atomwaffen Division guys from America had that experience in 2019. Secondly, over the past decade and a half, Central and Eastern Europe really has become part of what I call the transnational far-right right-wing um, event uh, calendar, right? Um, this refers to the networks of large-scale 
events, festivals, combat sports tournaments, and marches. So it has become really the key networking hubs that gets the whole transnational movement working both in Europe as well as in North America. The most striking example, of course, here is the Polish <coughs> Independence Day March on 11th of November that you have written about, which really is the largest far-right event in Europe, several hundred thousand participants every year. A few months ago, we at CP also did an in-depth study of the march and its functionality, and the event is really more accurately described as a far-right happening. So it's not just the march, it's concerts, it's uh, discussion groups, it's uh, tournaments in a whole week in November in uh, Poland. Now, that the transnational far-right event circus is picking up again, right? So there was, of course, a break during COVID where concerts uh, and, and uh, festivals were no longer able to be organized. Now they're picking up again. We had in the first six months, 2023 in Germany, more concerts than we had in the entire 2019 from the far-right scene. Um, Central and Eastern Europe also serves as an alternative location for events that have already been banned. The most obvious example here, of course, is um, the Kampf der Nibelungen, Kampf of the Nibelungen, which for many years has been the major combat sports event in Europe for the far right scene. And it's been banned since 2019, just before COVID kicked in in Germany. Now it's simply the European fight night and was held in May this year in Budapest. So it brings together all of the participants of Kampf der Nibelungen simply now in Central and Eastern Europe. Finally, the war in Ukraine since 2014, and especially since the Russian reinvasion of 2022, has led to a militarization of the far-right networks in the region and in Europe as a whole. My colleague at CEP, Alexander Ritzmann, just finished a report on the active clubs networks to highlight that issue. However, already the first Russian invasion in 2014 resulted in some unintended consequences that are quite worrying in our view. As a result of seeing the military challenges that Ukraine grappled with in the early stages of the first invasion in 2014, many governments in Central and Eastern Europe ramped up paramilitary training infrastructures in the, of their citizens, really. So this led to a three-tiered uh, three structure of paramilitary training structures, one run by the state, the other one run by far-right networks themselves, which, from a transnational perspective, both are not quite as concerning because they're very strictly confined to the citizens of these countries. However, there is a third strand that is the commercial paramilitary training infrastructure that grew in the last decade, um, and that trains simply anyone who can pay. And there are several cases of Western extremists really traveling to these far-right uh, uh, paramilitary, uh, to these commercial paramilitary training infrastructures to get trained there and then come back and conduct attacks. This is really a problem. And here, clearly, something needs to be done. Ideally, of course, at the regulatory level of the European Union. Uh, and uh, if you want to read a little bit more in detail about that issue, in 2021, we did a report mapping out those training infrastructures at CEP. And thank you so much. That's my opening statement. Thank you. We're going to go next uh, to Yulia Ebner, who is joining us virtually. Yes, hello, good morning from London to Pittsburgh. It's a real pleasure to be joining you today, even though it's just virtual. Um, I would like to highlight some of the trends I've been able to observe in my research. I've been um, looking into extremism and radicalization dynamics in Europe, but also North America for the last seven years. And I would say that the region of Central and Eastern Europe has really become a hotspot in many regards. And I just want to highlight some of the major trends of why I think it's important to um, pay particular attention to this region, including also for US researchers and practitioners and why this might be relevant for your work as well. Um, I would say the first, uh, one of the first trends is that it is really a hotspot for the new right, the European new right, which has of course also many um, kind of cross interlinkings and, and also cross inspiration with the US old right. So the most influential movement within that new right, I would say, is generation identity, that pan-European white nationalist movement where the figurehead is actually based in, in Austria, Martin Selner. And um, of course, generation identity has pioneered the great replacement ideology, which has inspired a whole series of terrorist attacks in the last few years, including the Christchurch attack but also, of course, and, and most of you will know this in this room, the Pittsburgh uh, shooting, the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting. 
I, I actually went undercover with Generation Identity a few years ago, and one of the most important observations I made when joining um, their networks was that it's a very networked, internationally networked and highly, um, yeah, highly sophisticated movement when it comes to its branding. So they've adopted a lot of the tactics of the US old right. They are also very well networked with U their US counterparts, but at the same time they've exported parts of their ideologies like the Great Replacement to, to US sympathizers. And they've also managed to get a lot of funding, crowdsourcing um, funds from US donors and from US uh, sympathizers, which I think is quite interesting in the context of speaking of, of their uh, very much their influence, not just within Central Europe and Eastern Europe, but also beyond these borders. Then the second trend I want to highlight is, um, and, and Dr. Hans-Jakob Schindler already touched on this, but is that Central and Eastern Europe has really become an epicenter of radicalization for the more traditional neo-Nazi movements and networks. Um, I went to one of the movement's um, main festivals, uh, neo-Nazi music festivals and MMA festivals, which was actually Kampf der Nibelungen at the German-Polish border. It was just before it was banned in Germany, so before 2019. And again, here I again want to highlight the very interconnected nature of this movement. I hadn't been aware of this, to be honest. I saw this more traditional neo-Nazi scene as a very locally rooted movement. But um, actually, I, I met a lot of people who came from, of course, from Poland, because it was happening at the Polish border, but also from other countries like Hungary, from Romania, uh, Serbia. And it was interesting to see that they really stretched, their networks really stretched across Central and Eastern Europe, but also beyond. And of course, the internet, and in particular, some of the mixed martial arts videos on YouTube, but also, um, also some of the alternative tech platforms where they can uh, connect over, they have played a major role in, in the internationalization of this network. Again, also, of course, the music, uh, music as a hobby community, and also the mixed martial arts, those are all elements that have enabled them to reach out to new audiences, but across the world, really. And then third, um, I would say the region is also a hotbed for QAnon, conspiracy myth, and Reichsbürger, um, basically sovereign citizen movements and, and radicalization. I would almost call it the second biggest market for QAnon ideas following the US. Uh, of course, the US is still um, one of the, the major, I mean, has been one of the major exporters or is the major exporter of QAnon, um, and it also originated there. But the movement has quickly spread across Germany, across Austria, and also some other countries in, in Central and Eastern Europe. And now studies show that 5% of Germans actually now hold uh, ideas that are closely affiliated with QAnon and with this sovereign citizen uh, Reichsbürger movement that are deeply anti-democratic in nature. So 5% is, I would say, in the context of Germany, quite a, um, a concerning number. There has, of course, also been, and that's gone a bit more under the radar than the much more high-profile um, capital riots in the U.S., but there has been an attempt in Germany by the, by the QAnon and, and Reichsbürger movement to, um, to attack the, or to, to basically storm the German parliament, the German Reichstag. And there has also been a plot which has been foiled by the security services to overthrow um, the government last year again, coming from the same community or the same movements. And again, um, like with the other previous two movements that I, um, that I spoke about, again, there are very strong international links that also um, really connect or connect the US QAnon movement to um, these more Central and European uh, and Eastern European QAnon and conspiracy theory movements, where I've seen a lot of collaboration, but also recycling of online materials, propaganda materials that are then being tailored to the local context and to uh, local politicians that they see as political opponents or that they then embed within the broader conspiracy myth. But again, there is a very strong link to, to the US networks um, of the QAnon movement. And then a final point I want to make is more on, a, on in the political arena where we see a very strong 
political radicalization, or what I call the mainstreaming of extremist ideas in my latest book, Going Mainstream. This is, of course, exemplified by um, hyper-conservative parties that have further radicalized and, and flirted with extreme right ideas, like the, the Law and Justice um, Party in Poland, but also uh, Viktor Orban's party in Hungary. And it's also shown in the cases of, of far-right populist parties that are gaining traction across uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Of course, the alternative for Germany is right now, um, and many of you will have followed this, but is right now at the height of both its radicalism in terms of really spreading very extreme ideas, uh, but also its popularity. It's really at an all-time high, combining very toxic narratives with a very popular um, popular position in German politics. The same is true for the Freedom Party in Austria, my home country, where um, we now just had a poll coming out earlier this month that the Freedom Party, the far right populist party, is actually topping the polls at the moment. So these are all very concerning, um, I would say, concerning trends, especially in, in this region that is, of course, very close right now to the Ukraine war um, that is also very much affected by the economic and, uh, and living cost crisis and by the energy crisis and where we might see these radicalization dynamics exacerbate even further in the coming months. Um, so I would say the threat is not just one of, of kind of imminent violence and terrorism and, and potentially a rise of hate crimes, but the threat is also more longer term in terms of stability of Europe, but also a, a threat to democracy and to minority rights. Thank you so much. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Yulia. Uh, Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michael. Please do accept my apologies for my English with strange accent coming from Central Europe. I hope it will be understandable. And let me ask for, uh, for my presentation. I have a few slides which I will document what I would like to uh, come with. Uh, you know, as a person from Central Europe, and by Central Europe I mean the old Middle Europa, it means uh, Germany, Austria, and Visegrad group countries, four Visegrad group countries, uh, are at the moment very much all of them practically, to, well, Germany, to, it's just starting, backsliding from previous positions, backsliding from liberal democracies that uh, were typical for the whole region just a few years ago. And, uh, well, so who can be better to speak about it than a person from Central Europe? Uh, you know, just yesterday, we realized that AFD is on a second place in public opinion polls in Germany, exactly as it was already said, uh, far-right political party is leading polls in, in Austria. But speaking about Slovakia, country I'm coming from, uh, there are elections uh, uh, on Saturday, uh, and you know, two far-right political parties plus one neo-Nazi party might eventually form the government. Uh, I would still hope that we might prevent it, but it's, it's on the table already. So, uh, and this is happening uh, in times when uh, prosperity in a region is unprecedented. Of course, there are some problems after pandemic and uh, consequences of a war in Ukraine, but in all those countries, uh, people are living, uh, standard, standard of living is uh, higher than any time in the past. So it's not so much connected with uh, economic crisis. You know, all those schemes coming from 20th century that when unemployment is rising and, and there are economic problems, people are tending to vote for far-right political parties. That's not really the case of, of the region anymore. This time, you know, Central Europeans are simply guilty for the backsliding, you know. We were looking for an enemy and an enemy was us. I, I think, okay. And what is happening, as you see on, on a slide, uh, the whole Central European region basically lost the consensus about the liberal future. Uh, and, and we are somehow finding our, ourselves in these soft autocracies, illiberal democracies. But the problem is, and this is a warning uh, coming from Central Europe, be careful because situation in Central Europe has always been a warning sign, you know, some premonition what will happen in other parts of Europe and the world. Don't forget that World War I and World War II started in Central Europe and it spread it to, to other parts of the world. So, so the situation is very dangerous. And let me, let me show you uh, other slide, please. Uh, 
the, the situation in Slovakia, maybe, you know, as a, as a professor, I'm, I'm always used to walk, you know, to be entertaining. Uh, so, yeah, let's, let's return to, to those, the slide. And this is, this is a uh, graph which is showing from our public opinion poll how people are unsatisfied with the situation in the country. Uh, look, uh, only less than 20% think that the country is going in a good direction. So what do you think, what, what people will do in elections coming in a few days? Next, next slide. The same is with the economic situation. Again, situ Slovaks are living uh, in a situation they've never been to. You know, the prosperity coming also thanks to European Union membership is, is almost shockingly good, you know. Look, uh, again, less than 20% of, of people think that situation is rather good or, or perfect. And that those who believe that it's perfect, it's they're basically close to zero. Um, of course, these people, these people, the perception of reality is much more important than reality itself. The next slide, please. And of course, but just, just to mention, you know, neighboring Austria, I'm living right next to the border of Austria. Uh, far right political uh, party is leading the poll in a country with one of the best healthcare systems in, in the world fantastic ski slopes, actually better than you have in the United States, uh, you know, fantastic education system, and still far-right political party is leading the poll. So what, what is behind it? What is behind the curtain? It's various threats that people perceive, and this is a good example. You have all countries of Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the whole region, and the question is very simple. Do you feel threat coming, uh, you know, uh, to, to your identity or values, uh, from uh, Western, uh, Western countries, European Union, United States of America. And look, those countries where the threat of far-right political par parties is the highest, Slovakia, which is on the right-hand side, you know, anti-American, very anti-European Union, and very anti-Western. So people feel threatened. They, and it's not important what it is, but somebody is threatening them, you know, and, and politicians are, of course, utilizing it, and they, they, they keep talking about migrants, LGBTI people, you know, which is on the table at the moment. Next slide, please. Uh, symbolic, you know, and the symbolic danger is coming exactly from migrants. Look, as many as 75% of people in case of Slovakia or the neighboring Czech Republic feel threat uh, from, from migrants, and it might be realistic threat, it might be symbolic, or it might be even interaction anxiety. Uh, next, I, I, I know that I'm, I'm coming to, to the end. What is behind it is the level of conspiratory thinking. And QAnon was mentioned here, and of course, you know, we, we might all laugh about people who believe that there is a pizza house in Washington DC and in basement, you know, they are sucking blood for, from whoever. But you know, even in the United States, there are groups of people who believe in it. In case of Slovakia, be careful, and this is the, pro the, the problem of some of countries of Central Europe, the number of those people who are conspiratory, and we sociologists, we can make index of conspiratory thinking, those people, you know, we are talking about more than 50% of people. And suddenly, you know, the dynamic of society is changing. Uh, what was right is suddenly wrong. What was black is white. Liberator is occupier. You know, and, and uh, suddenly you are living in an in a Orwell's Orwell's novel, not, not in a liberal democracy. Uh, next slide, and we are the, the, the same. Those who believe that there is a threat, uh, you know, of, from the groups that want to establish a totalitarian world order. You have Austria, a country which didn't have a communism, where it's just 22. But on the other side, Slovakia with 60% of people. So suddenly, you know, you have a new, new world. Uh, and the next, well, uh, traditional thing for, unfortunately, for Central Europe, belief in uh, Jewish conspir consp conspiration worldwide. Uh, in case of Hungary or Slovakia, look, it's basically 50%. So practically every second person when you walk on those streets believe in some kind of conspiration. But it's, it's not focused on the Jews living in the country. It's focused on those mysterious people uh, sitting in a Ebony Tower somewhere in New York City and uh, basically manipulating the world. Uh, and last, lastly, uh, 
of course, all those uh, consp conspirations that far-right um, uh, far right people believe in are interconnected. So once you believe in one conspiration, it's very likely that you will be vulnerable to believe in uh, some others. And this is a very good example of it. The qu very simple question coming from Academy of Science from Slovakia. How would you like war in Ukraine to be finished? Though the, the blue uh, answers you see, that's the prefer preferential uh, of Ukraine to, uh, winning, uh, and red, Russia should win. The first column are those who have a booster. Those, uh, the second is those who had just one shot in, in, during the COVID. And the third is those who were not vaccinated at all. I mean, you clearly see interconnections be between those, the, those things. And lastly, uh, and I hope that that's, that's, that will be the last one. Uh, of course, it, we cannot omit the responsibility of political leaders. Uh, political leaders, enemies of open society in our region and in all countries of our region are pouring oil into the water and what they created in some countries, Hungary and Poland at the moment are the best examples. Unfortunately, I, I suspect that Slovakia will follow very soon, created something what we in Central Europe call paranoid governmental dis government disorder. Uh, and all seven points, uh, as you see them, I will not read them, uh, are already in place in a region. And once you will find yourself in this situation, that backsliding from liberal democracy is all, almost certain. Thank you very much. Thank you. One of the questions I've had with violent fire right groups is, is there a hidden hand behind some of these actors? Uh, our next speaker, Thomas, is gonna to touch on that. Thanks, Mike, uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, and thanks for the organizers for having me and Mike for having me on this panel. I feel privileged to be here. And indeed, what I would like to do uh, in the five minutes I have now is to basically talk to you very quickly about a project that we are running uh, at the International Center for Counterterrorism, which is basically looking at Russia's influence over far-right extremism across Europe, particularly looking at 10 different countries, most of which are located in Central and Eastern Europe, but also looking at countries uh, in the North, South, and Western part uh, of Europe. Because what we're trying to identify is basically what is the scope, the diversity, the magnitude, the intensity uh, of Russia's influence over far-right extremism in all of these different countries to try to put a finger on Russia's toolbox on patterns uh, of, of this influence. And because we are ICCT, uh, we're particularly interested in, in, in terrorism and violent extremism. And so we're not only looking at Russia's influence over the radical rights parties, and that has been, uh, uh, there's been a lot of research on that already, but we're really trying to, to look at how uh, radical right parties are enabling violence and also how Russia is interacting directly or indirectly with violent extremist groups or individuals. So that is, in a nutshell, uh, what we're trying to do in this project. And what I want to do in the few minutes I have here is basically to talk to you about three very concrete examples out of more than 20 examples that we are basically addressing uh, in, in this project. Uh, particularly highlighting Russia's influence over violent uh, incidents or violent uh, movements. So let me quickly uh, talk to you about those, uh, those three particular events. Uh, the first one uh, happened in February 2018 in a part of Ukraine uh, where basically uh, a cultural center was set on fire by three individuals. And basically behind this event, the idea was to present this incident uh, as neo-Nazi, as basically uh, part of Ukrainians' government not respecting, not respecting uh, the rights of the minorities because it was a Hungarian cultural center and there is an important Hungarian community in that part of Ukraine. And that obviously steered tensions between Hungary uh, and Ukraine, Hungary being a member of the European Union and of NATO. Uh, but in reality, when investigations really started, what we discovered is that this was a false flag attack. The three individuals that conducted this arson attack were actually Polish citizens, members of a far-right extremist violent group called Falanga, pro-Russian group, 
who basically had planned carefully this operation to steer precisely tension, diplomatic tensions between Hungary and Ukraine. And actually, these individuals had been recruited, approached, paid by a German self-claimed journalist himself, very closely connected to Russia and to Germany's uh, far-right AfD uh, party. So that is a very interesting example because it does bring this Russia's malign influence in a very concrete violent incident, but also it does highlight the fundamentally transnational nature of, of a lot of these activities and networks. In a second incident, in June 2017 in Czech Republic, another false flag attack conducted by, believe it or not, a 71 years old individual who basically cut down trees and put those trees on rail tracks with the very specific intention to derail a train and potentially kill a lot of people. So luckily, uh, that didn't work out, um, but he did it. And this individual was basically very much uh, embezzled by Russian disinformation. He was an adherent also of a far-right, extremist, racist, pro-Russian party in Czech Republic. And basically, as the investigation showed, he really lived in a disinformation uh, paranoid kind of bubble, and we already hear it, other speakers talk about, uh, about this world uh, out there. And that example uh, is quite interesting also. Uh, and it was a false flag, sorry, I should have uh, mentioned it was a false flag attack because basically what he did is that he then left a number of leaflets uh, around uh, the place of the incident, uh, basically uh, claiming Inshallah, and, and so basically Allah Akbar, uh, so basically what he wanted to do with his attack is basically to blame uh, migrants, uh, Muslim migrants in Czech Republic because he obviously wanted to get rid of them. Uh, and so what this incident shows very clearly uh, is that this information coupled and supported and echoed by local forces can have very concrete, very serious, violent, lethal consequences on the ground. And the third example that I wanted to share with you, it's in Serbia, and it is a group called as People's Patrol, which is a violent far-right vigilante group that basically spreads Russian disinformation and organizes anti-migrant operations, which as you can imagine are not peaceful operations. And that group has been ongoing for some time now, and that group interacts very closely with notably Russian imperial movement, which has been banned, designated here in the United States, interacts with Wagner Group, frequently report on Russia Today. They are invited as a legitimate uh, voice on Russia Today, uh, representing uh, the other side uh, of uh, European uh, voices. And basically, uh, that is a very, uh, very violent, very dangerous uh, group very much connected to, to Russia. So all of these examples together, and this is where I will conclude, Mike, all of these examples together illustrate uh, the different types of influence, whether direct influence or indirect influence. It doesn't matter so much that Russia, a foreign stakeholder, can have on far-right extremist milieus, and that that influence in the short term and in the longer term can have very concrete, very serious, lethal, dramatic consequences in those different countries in Europe. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Adela, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and thank you to the organizers for having me here. What a truly humbling experience. Um, my hope is to use my five minutes or so to talk about some of the solutions to many of the issues discussed here today. Um, but first, for context, uh, something that U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken recently shared that I think is important, namely, more democracies are under threat, challenged from the inside by elected leaders who exploit resentments and stoke fears, erode independent judiciaries and media, enrich cronies, 
and cracked down on civil society and political opposition, and challenged from the outside by autocrats who spread disinformation, who weaponize corruption, and who meddle in elections. At the State Department's Global Engagement Center, the GEC, we work to combat foreign state and foreign non-state actors, disinformation and propaganda outside of the United States. This work uh, includes coordinating across the US interagency and with international partners and allies and many of the organizations represented here today. Uh, it's important, again, to note the work that we do only takes place inter uh, internationally, outside of our borders, however. Broadly speaking, the GEC supports more than 100 civil society programs worldwide that focus foreign, uh, that uh, try to help foreign nations build resilience to propaganda and disinformation from actors including the PRC, so China, Russia, and violent extremist organizations the kinds of programs we typically fund focus on investigative journalism, fact-checking, uh, media literacy, uh, digital forensics, and uh, many of the organizations here today we have worked with and funded in the past. So while the majority of the GEC's work today uh, focuses on combating state-sponsored disinformation, uh, we got our start encountering violent extremist organizations, disinformation and propaganda, from organizations such as Al-Qaeda and ISIS. So many of the lessons that we have learned stem from those efforts. So in this context, I've been working for the last eight years with university and think tank-based researchers across many disciplines to bring um, research findings to US and international governmental practitioners to make us more effective at combating these issues. Uh, this has included tracking best practices at the nexus of research and practice. And additionally, as Michael mentioned, in my personal capacity for my dissertation, I interviewed authoritarian populist elites in eastern Germany. I wanted to understand the role of grievances at the nexus with disinformation and was particularly interested in economic versus cultural grievances, their lines of effort, their networks, and especially ways to counter them. So to add to the conversation today, I want to share some of the best practices as we have observed them uh, at the GEC for combating disinformation, including from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, so RENV as we call them in the US government. We've come to understand that disinformation is a symptom of much deeper problems in society. And so what we need are human-centric rather than just tech-focused solutions. And we need human rights-respecting solutions. It's important that we as democracies and democratic actors respect the human rights and fundamental freedoms, including freedom of expression of all groups, including those of marginalized and underserved communities and women. As governments, as organizations, as corporations, as individuals in our private lives, it is imperative that we condemn hate speech and other abhorrent expressions. We should not seek to criminalize them unless they constitute incitement to imminent violence or a true threat of an act of violence. Because criminalizing speech does not change hateful views and it doesn't stop disinformation and propaganda from spreading. Therefore, countries should step up their efforts to ensure that reliable, objective, evidence-based information is accessible to all. It's going to take not only a whole-of-government approach, it's going to take a whole-of-society approach, where each sector is contributing in the area in which they are most effective. That is why I'm so happy to see so many different sectors present at this conference. In some areas, this is also going to mean that governmental actors are going to have to play a supportive role to civil society. But to be effective, these efforts have to include tech and private sector companies, as well as civil society, government, and academia. So for those looking to counter disinformation and its impact, it's important to consider and address factors affecting different groups and to tailor approaches in order to reach and resonate with key audiences. 
REMV is not only a young skinhead problem, as we know. So different communicators and different audiences require custom approaches and efforts that are multi-sectoral in their essence are going to be the kinds that are most effective, including coordination between the public and the private sectors. So generally speaking, we've come to understand that three broad lines of effort form the foundation of what we call best practices or perhaps common practices is more, more appropriate. Namely, protection and respect of human rights, proactive communications, and resilience building activities. So very briefly for each of those categories, uh, when we're talking about human rights respecting, of course, uh, support for victims of REMV violence is important but so is the inclusion of marginalized and excluded communities along the way in promoting respect for human rights and democratic principles while fighting discrimination in all of its forms, including racism, xenophobia, ableism, sexism, transphobia, and many of the others. When it comes to proactive communications by governmental and non-governmental communicators, we have to communicate about these issues all the time not only in times of crisis. And these messages need to have a pro-democratic element to them along the way, including in proactive counter-narratives and counter-messaging. Once again, the credibility of the communicator to the target audience is of paramount importance. And outreach should take place not only online, but also offline. So when appropriate, also you may consider involving former violent extremists for uh, uh, interventions and outreach. For example, the short documentary, Stranger at the Gate, uh, is the story of a man who was planning to attack a mosque, but who ends up being introduced to its community and who welcomed them. In de-radicalization efforts, focus on disengagement from the violent extremist organization rather than focusing on ideological de-radicalization in order to be much more effective. And finally, when it comes to resilience building, we want to educate audiences. We want to have them be ready to recognize disinformation, be able to recognize credible media and digital resources. But we also want to see malign actors exposed for the hypocrisy and, uh, uh, and the propaganda that they spread uh, and to build uh, audiences' resilience to it, to know how to respond when they are encountering these narratives in their lives, as well as organizations. And finally, we'd like to see many more facilitated exchanges between different groups. Um, this is uh, between different sectors, but also different nations. So for example, the US Department of State's Educational and Cultural Affairs Bureau every year brings many, many uh, different uh, international visitors to the United States for exchanges on many of the topics discussed here today. But we need to see more coordination and cooperation amongst stakeholders internationally uh, in order to tackle the growing transnational nature of these organizations. They are incredibly well connected. They are internationally connected. And so we have to be as well. Thank you. In the remaining 15 minutes or so that we have, I want to ask a couple of questions of our panelists, and please uh, limit your response to no more than a minute. <laughs> um, and first, I want to say that um, a couple of points on Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, a majority of the Holocaust memorial sites are in these countries, Poland, Slovakia, Eastern Germany, elsewhere. Um, and secondly, uh, it, a lot of, as I noted in the, the intro, uh, last August there were two Americans from California, known uh, members of hate groups, traveled to Auschwitz. They held anti-Semitic anti signs outside of the memorial site directed towards a member of the ADL. Um, there was a, a terrorist attack in Bratislava um, last October uh, targeting the LGBTQI plus um, uh, community. Uh, there will be a speaker in the next panel talking about that, a survivor of that attack. Um, and then also uh, the attacker from the, the Christchurch attacks in 2019 spent a lot of time uh, traveling across Poland and other countries in this region. Uh, so my two, my two questions for the panelists, uh, first, 
Do you see a direct correlation between attacks by violent far-right actors and divisive rhetoric from politicians and the media? And my second question is, why do violent far-right actors from the U.S. and other countries uh, from the West find this region so appealing uh, for networking and training? Yeah, I mean, happy to start, uh, Mike. Uh, I mean, very good questions, and I would say, I mean, as in the example that I give, I mean, from Czech Republic, I mean, you can really see that politicians uh, and other types of leaders, or so-called leaders in, in, in Europe, and particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, cannot go on, I think, unchecked by basically uh, disseminating or echoing or just sharing, you know, this kind of hateful, sometimes still lawful, but still hateful kind of rhetoric without recognizing uh, and without being confronted to the fact that this has very concrete, very serious consequences. Of course, if you spread you know, hateful speech, it will have consequences because it reaches an audience and that audience eventually ends up in some kind of you know, rabbit hole bubble and sort of acts on it and looks for confirmation bias. And unfortunately, there's a lot of tools out there that facilitate confirmation bias, of course, thinking of, uh, of certain uh, platforms online here uh, that sort of facilitate that as well. So yes, uh, correlation in, in, in science is always a, a, a word that we want to be careful with, uh, but there, is, there are consequences and we need to confront these uh, politicians uh, with those consequences. I want to see if Yulia, um, uh, you're already on the screen on a, mo on a monitor. Uh, over to you. Yes, um, really good questions. I would say I, I would like to reply to the second question. I, I definitely think that Central and Eastern Europe has become almost glorified by parts of the U.S. Uh, far-right extremist uh, movement. I think partly because it is actually in many of the countries it is quite ethnically and, and culturally homogenous. And nonetheless, there has been this resurgence of far-right populist parties, but also ultra-conservative parties, who've really um, rolled back some of the human rights or who've been really um, quite backward-looking when it comes to LGBTQ rights, when it comes to women's rights or to traditional gender uh, and family models, and also, of course, to migration policies. So there has been a certain um, glorification of that region by U.S. white supremacists and U.S. the wider U.S. far-right extremist movement. Um, yeah, and, and I would definitely say that that is also intertwined with the first question you asked, with the how politics plays into that and how po how politicians can, of course, exacerbate what we then see, um, what then movements see as a legitimization and the normalization of their rhetoric. Uh, my, my latest book is really exactly about that, how some of the very extreme fringe ideas that used to be observable in the darkest corners of the internet in extremist groups where I had to lurk and get vetted through uh, just five years ago, that, that ha those have now leaked into public discourse and have leaked into the mainstream. And of course politicians, but also um, celebrity influencers uh, and also media commentators have really played a big role in mainstreaming these ideas. Right, I mean, look, there's also this element that, you know, the small fact that we do have a war going on since 2014 in the region that is uh, really quite helpful. Uh, there is nothing that leads lives uh, into fascist movements more than really armed conflict. It really is the, um, and we saw this when we analyzed in the last couple of years, who actually from the right-wing extremist or far-right, as we call it in this event, networks would go to Ukraine, right? It, it was there equivalent to Iraq and Syria in 2014, right? Everyone else went to fight with the Islamists. They went to the conflict there, right? So this Russian aggression, this imperial expansion did enable networks to grow. And then there was a very concerned, very deliberate and quite successful effort of the Ukrainian government to put the lid on this again after 2014. And in 2019, you know, these big movements like the right sector or the, at that time, uh, Azov regiment really weren't a political factor anymore just when uh, Russia reinvaded, right? So it, we can't leave this out of, out of the fact that we do have a decade and a half of crises in Europe, right? Financial crisis 2008, Euro crisis 2011, then we had the wave of migrants in 2015, 
Then we had uh, uh, parallel the war in Ukraine and a reunion in Ukraine, and in the middle we had COVID. So it shook some of, and this is not just Central Eastern Europe. Look at the elections in Spain, look at the elections in Sweden, look at the election, you know, the polling that we've talked about in Germany, look who is in government in Italy. So this shook a couple of really deeply held beliefs and, and uh, uh, um, patterns that we had in the European Union since the Second World War very deeply. And that insecurity breeds people with very simple answers. And the othering is the simplest answer for. Yeah, uh, let, let me respond to your first question, but if I will get a chance to respond to second, uh, I, I would do that as well. Uh, hate speech and hate crimes are interconnected, and we not only think so, I mean, we, we know it, because uh, in all the reports that we're covering it, we, we see the interlinkages. Once, you know, the atmosphere in the country is heating and it's full of anger and aggressiveness, it pours out into the streets. It, those of you who would like to see reports of this kind, uh, I'm a representative of Slovakia in ECRI, European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, which is anti-discrimination body of Council of Europe, and we are producing reports on all member states of the Council of Europe uh, uh, every five years, and there is a huge part in every report on every single country of Council of Europe uh, there. Uh, in case of shooting in Bratislava, by the way, which you mentioned, which occurred last year, was a perfect example, and a very unfortunate example. The atmosphere against LGBTI was heating for years, and many of us, we were warning, sooner or later, this will bring violence. It's not whether, but when. And of, co of course, and unfortunately, we were right. Uh, and let me add one, one important thing which is ne necessary to, to mention what, since we are in the United States. Europeans and Americans have a very different view of uh, regulations on social media. And social media poisoned your public space as well. But, you know, you don't want to regulate it. We Europeans, we would like to regulate it. Uh, and let me give you an example uh, from Slovakia. Slovakia is poisoned, and it is where it is, also because of Facebook. Uh, in your country, it might be Twitter. In Slovakia, it's Facebook, which is absolutely toxic. Uh, and there are various people who are poisoning the public space. Uh, in the past, one of them, the most influential and extremely dangerous, uh, many, some NGOs were asking Meta to close it down. The, later, Ministry of Foreign Affairs was asking to close it down. Finally, Prime Minister of Slovakia asked Meta to close it down. You know what happened? Nothing. They, don't, they didn't even respond. Uh, somewhere at the end of the day, four congressmen um, from the United States arrived to Bratislava, and the Prime Minister of Slovakia was complaining about, about non-responsive Meta. So these four congressmen wrote to Meta, and in three weeks, miraculously, uh, the account was closed. Uh, you know, and, and this is the point that, uh, of course, we need also uh, collaborators on, on these sides. You know, it's not only protecting human rights, and, and I, I'm fully on the side of what, what was said uh, here, because that's extremely important, actually the most important. But then there are key players here who are trying to pretend that they are not part of the game. Della, do you want I to? Th I think that the question has been answered okay. very thoroughly. Great. Um, before we wrap up, I want to touch on a couple of things. Uh, eradicate hate is focused on action, and we've talked about how it's important to expo expose foreign influence, uh, to increase information exchanges between American, North American, European counterparts, global globally for that matter, um, uh, and increasing research on uh, the threat landscape. Uh, the one area we haven't touched on yet is the importance of following the money. Um, I want to give uh, Hans uh, the, the final word on the counter-extremism project's report because I, I think it's very important for policymakers and practitioners to both read that report and find ways to implement it. Well, thank you so much. Um, we've been working on this issue for a while and incidentally there's also a working group in, in, the, in the summit on this subject. and. On uh, tomorrow afternoon, we're going to present our results. So the idea is the following. It's all very good to be an extremist, and it's much better if you're an extremist with money. So rather than um, you know, saying, let's 
focus on all of the other things, that's why important, but we're not looking at the money because it's complicated, right? So you don't have a counterterrorism financing structure <coughs> that applies here because they're not proscribed organizations in the United States. How about looking at the commercial side of things? Because if you're blatantly anti-government, and if you want to bring the political system down, and all of these groups, essentially, that's the aim, paying your income tax and paying your corporation tax, and because they do have, uh, they do have uh, commercial enterprises, is not really on the top of your list. So you have a very obvious weakness here where you can tackle this issue without having the discussion about whether or not this ideology is legitimate, whether it's a First Amendment problem or not. You're looking at very simple predicate crimes. Money laundering is money laundering, tax evasion is tax evasion. That's number one. Number two, there is a element of overlap between these, in, uh, with these, these networks, not as strong here in the United States, but also existing in the United States, uh, but very much in Europe, between them and organized crime. Again, don't understand this as an organized crime problem, because obviously compared to the cartels in Mexico, these are very, very small. But if you disrupt their financing, you're disrupting the corporations of a whole network. Because one thing that is clear is that these financial networks are not the ones that are directly involved in violence. They are the ones who are generating the, buy the money, giving it to those who then perpetrate the violence. So you have a much broader bang, bang for your buck that you would have by simply disrupting a, a drug operation. It's important to recognize that that's the case. The third one is you have pretty much all the levers on the technology here in this country. You have a very well-regulated crypto industry by now. You have all of the big exchanges, have American exposure, all of the cryptocurrency transactions, all of the major crowdfunding plat uh, platforms where this is happening are in US jurisdiction. If you can get better cooperation, you now have the ability to tackle customers with data that the financial industry could never do. They will see their customer at the onboarding process and never, you know, and then doing the, the repeat uh, uh, double checking of the customer data. These companies deal with users on a 24 seven basis. So you have a much, much better disruption opportunity there if you get those companies on board and cooperating with them. I wanna, can we please give a round of applause to our panelists? Thank you so much.